It's the e-commerce master plan podcast here to help you solve your marketing problems and grow your e-commerce business. Cutting through the hype to bring you inspiration and advice from the e-commerce sector and beyond. Here's your host, Chloe Thomas. Hello, welcome to another episode of the e-commerce master plan podcast. I'm as I always am, Chloe Thomas, the host of the show, and it is as it always is. Great to have you guys out there listening. It continues to flabbergast me quite how many countries in which you guys are listening to this little show that I create on a weekly basis. So um so thank you very much for being out there and, and paying attention. Um in today's episode I've got a corker for you. I'm chatting to someone who's selling a product you wouldn't necessarily think would be happening on the in the e-commerce space. And she, because she's got that kind of different approach to it all, there's an awful lot of things to learn about what happens in the offline world, how to deal with your customers, with your suppliers. Um, it's a lot of a lot of really good stuff in this one. And I think you're going to thoroughly enjoy listening to it too. Before we get into it though, please do check out the sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by Klaviyo, the most recommended growth marketing platform on the market. Klaviyo helps more than 28,000 e-commerce brands globally to grow their businesses through high-value customer relationships. From a shopper's first impression to each subsequent purchase, Klaviyo understands every interaction, empowering brands to create more personalised marketing moments. When you have a 360-degree view of the customer, the growth possibilities are endless. And the results speak for themselves. Klaviyo customers have made more than £2.8 billion in revenue through Klaviyo in the last year alone. Visit klaviyo.com forward slash masterplan. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash masterplan. Are you wasting time updating product quantities each time you sell something? What about sending new customer orders for fulfilment? Imagine taking all that time and putting it to better use. That's what Ecom Dash promises to help you do. This e-commerce software will be your 24-7 salesperson, updating 20 plus platforms like Amazon and eBay with accurate product details and sending customer orders to your fulfillment choice without you lifting a finger. Get time back to focus on growing your business. Try it free at ecom-.com forward slash masterplan and use promo code masterplan to get 50% off your first two months. That's E-C-O-M-D-A-S-H dot com forward slash masterplan. And now to introduce today's special guest. Rebecca Wilson is the chief curator at Saatchi Art, the world's leading online art gallery. Launched online in 2011, in Q3 2019, they grew by a whopping 35%. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, Chloe. How are you doing? Great. Very, very happy uh, to be here with you. I'm really happy you're here too because I'm I do love my art um, <laughs> and I always think it's such a fascinating thing to try and sell online. So um, so I'm it's, I'm really pleased to have you here so we can explore that a little bit a little bit as we as we go through this interview. But first off, I'd love to understand how you yourself as a as an art curator got into the world of e-commerce. Um, yeah, well, it was. Um Partly by accident, I would say, um, we were, and this is going back to actually the days when I worked at the Saatchi Gallery in London. Um, I worked there for seven years. Um, and uh, in actually in 2007, the gallery in London was undergoing renovation. And we were all sort of uh, getting slightly itchy feet, um, trying to kind of keep busy and then started thinking about well, what, what else could we be doing while this renovation is going on and taking rather longer than we had expected. Um, and we decided to try and um, make something of the Internet. Um, and if you think back to 2007, um, you know, the Internet was obviously it had, it had been around for, for a good while, but certainly within the art world, no one was really capitalizing on it. So we thought um, having, uh, you know, we knew a lot of very young emerging artists, uh, you know, we went to art school, degree shows and all the rest of it. And what we realized is that so many outstanding artists weren't getting taken on by brick and mortar galleries. And after a while, they would just sort of disappear. So we decided um, what we wanted to do was to try and bring together all the best aspects of um, 
great curation and uh, looking after artists properly, r- strong attention to um, collectors and what they're interested in, um, and bring that together with all the best aspects of the internet, which is effectively incredible kind of global reach. So that's how we started. Um, and we first of all built the platform um, as not an e-commerce platform. It was more of a kind of MySpace where um, artists could have a portfolio of their work. Oh, right. And yeah, and very rapidly, I think partly, well, uh, totally because of the, uh, the Saatchi brand and how, um, how well recognized it is all over the world um, amongst artists in particular, uh, we had tens of thousands of portfolios on our um, little SaatchiGallery.com. <laughs> wow. Um, so yeah, we didn't do any PR. We didn't do any marketing. So it was kind of, um, we were really stunned by it. Um, and then after about three, four years, we decided what we really needed to do is precisely to turn it into an e-commerce platform and to make it um, an alternative to having a brick and mortar gallery, that this was the future, that you didn't need to be dependent on a brick and mortar gallery representing, let's say, 20 artists, but you could be part of this incredible opportunity to show your work to people all over the world. Um, so that's how we came to um get going in 2011, as you said, as an e-commerce online gallery um, and based in Los Angeles. We started with about five people and we're now uh, 36, I think. Um, so it's grown phenomenally. Wow. And and I'm guessing, you know, you said there about, you know, the, the bricks and mortar, you're limited by geography. You're also limited by how many artists you can represent, aren't you? Whereas kind of your wall space in an online store is is infinite. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're running a brick and mortar gallery, you do probably 10 shows a year. Uh, that limits how many artists you can represent. Um, and the the frequency with which you can have a show as an artist at a brick and mortar gallery is probably every two to three years. So you're really at the mercy of someone else's schedule. And the great thing about being online is obviously it's the global reach, as I mentioned, but you can control your own destiny as an artist. If you have a new series of work or you've got just one new page, Painting, you can add it to your portfolio immediately. And because of the way we uh, run Saatchi Art and the fantastic curation team that we have here, we look at everything that's uploaded every day. So you immediately know that somebody is going to pay attention to the work that you've just completed and will start showing it to people who might want to buy it. So it's, I think it's a real liberation in that way for artists that you can actually just be much, much more in control um, of, uh, of your own work and who sees it and when they see it. So far in the interview, you've mentioned the artist an awful lot, and it kind of strikes me that you've almost got two customer groups. You've got the people who actually buy the art, and then you've got the artists. And obviously with the Saatchi name, as you said, it's quite easy to get them on board. But but do you find you spend almost as much time developing the relationship with the artist as you do with the eventual consumer? Um, uh, you're definitely right that we, we kind of view our artists and our um, uh, customers, buyers, that they're both our clients in a sense. Um, and I think the loyalty that we need to instill amongst artists is absolutely critical. You know, we're not the only online gallery. Um, there are others. We are the biggest, but um, there are others. And of course, you know, you want to work with really fantastic artists and to keep on working with them. Um, so, yeah, we do spend a lot of time um, building those relationships uh, with artists and thinking of new tools for them, um, how they can better show their work, what, what other kinds of opportunities we can offer them. And, of course, I definitely want to get on to speaking about um, the people who are buying art from us. But I think from an artist's perspective, and we do do an awful lot other than, um, you know, selling work online for them, which may sort of appear in an accidental way. Um, but, you know, we, we offer an art advisory service, for example. Um, and this is fantastic for artists because it's um, eight curators all working all day long with new clients who are looking for specific works. And they could be, it could be an individual looking for one work for their living room, or it could be uh, somebody who's very interested in investing in art, um, which we have a lot of expertise and knowledge about. Uh, It could be a fantastic new hotel and they're looking for 
public spaces, sculptures or guest room uh, works, all sorts of things like that. And we uh, recommend specific works for those projects. Um, so it's a really fantastic thing for artists. It's also pretty amazing for the, the clients who are buying the works because we don't charge for that service. And normally the going rate for um, an art advisor would be about $250 and not selling um, dollars per hour for that kind of service. So as you can probably tell, we're trying to sort of slightly disrupt, although I think that word is a little old, <laughs> um, but we're trying to sort of do things differently. Um, so, you know, having an online gallery, and when we started it in 2007, as I said, as this sort of platform, people thought we had lost our minds, that it was a crazy idea to sort of show art online. They thought we were even more crazy when in 2011 we started selling it online. <laughs> um, but it's been amazing for not only artists who are now making a living uh, in a way that they wouldn't have done without us, and also for people who really love art, um, you know, going into blue chip galleries and going to auction houses, it's still pretty much a, a, a fairly um, exclusive experience, which not that many people really feel comfortable doing. I mean, I don't feel that comfortable doing it. And I've been working in this business for 20 years. Um, but the great thing about an online gallery is that you of course, can strike up a, a close relationship with one of our curators. And we have very kind of long-standing relationships with buyers who, are, who keep coming back to us. Um, but you also have a kind of wonderful anonymity. Uh, and we'll sell, we, we don't mind who you are. We don't have a preferred list of buyers <laughs> with what galleries normally do. Um, so uh, I think it's really been a, a great kind of liberation for people who love art and love discovering it as well. I'm really glad you brought up the advisory service because I think it's, I think one of the reasons why, why a lot of people struggle with the idea of buying art online is because it feels a bit cold. And I think emotion is so important in art. You kind of want that emotive connection, which is, I was, you know, I was wondering if that was kind of one of the reasons why you'd started the advisory service. And, you know, and I was wondering how popular it was. So clearly it's very popular. Do you get, do you get many people who just buy something or do most of your customers come through the advisory piece? No, the um, the majority of our sales still come um, from people who are just looking themselves, they decide on something and they buy it. Um, but I would say that art advisory sales, it's about 30, between 30 and 40% of our business. So it's definitely significant. Um, and the reason that we started it is because of a, a very early recognition that, um, as I was saying, you know, buying art, going to galleries, um, knowing how to speak about art, what kind of language is used, um, mm -hmm. is, can be an intimidating experience for people. But at the same time, people really love going to the Tate or to MoMA in New York and really love going to big exhibitions like that. And I think there had been, let's say, five, ten years ago, some idea that you could go to a show like, you know, the, the next big exhibition at the Royal Academy, for example. But that was that was where art remained. And it wasn't something that you would have in your own home to really enjoy and experience. And I think the, the way that the internet and online galleries have really made access so much easier for people has totally kind of broken through that. And you no longer need to just get the poster or go to Ikea or get a print. Um, you can actually have an original work of art by a recent graduate or someone with much more experience and there's only one piece like it um, and it's affordable. So I think that's one of the great things that we have um, enabled amongst people who are perhaps new to art. Um, and I think that's why the art advisory service we run is, is, is so successful. It's so reassuring for people to know that there's someone there who they can chat to or email with, um, get some insider knowledge, get some tips and recommendations. Um, and we all, you know, we don't talk in some kind of jargon. We, we, you know, we make it a very, very um, uh, accessible, friendly, and also informative experience. And, and I think that people who don't know much about art really relish that. And how do they find you? Is it, Do you do, you know, a lot of, um, I don't know, postal mailings or Facebook advertising or Google ads, or is it more a word of mouth and PR thing to get people onto the website? I think it's a combination of things. I mean, obviously, we do do a lot of um, 
online advertising, um, Facebook and um, so on. But uh, one of the things that is interesting and may sound a little old school to some of your um, listeners um, is actually not as not a digital thing. Um, one of the things over the last few years that we've really put a lot of effort into is a printed catalogue. Um, and it's become incredibly successful. And I think what's interesting about that is, um, you know, over 32 pages, let's say, uh, you can see as a potential customer a huge range of different kinds of work. So you obviously it's a small sample of everything mm -hmm. that we represent. But I think there's something really lovely about that tangible experience of receiving something that's very, very nicely produced, that seems to come from a source that's intelligent, friendly, um, has expertise around curation. And then you can keep this object that comes through your door. You can share it with people. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think that's a, that's a very, very important um, uh, marketing tool for us. And, uh, you know, the, it, it goes to designers, um, which is becoming an increasing um, revenue stream for us. Very, very, mm -hmm. a lot of growth um, in that area for sort of hotels and big projects like that. Um, but also to a lot of um, new customers. And, you know, we put a lot of effort into the lists that we acquire and how we go about targeting the people that we think uh, would be most appreciative of the printed catalogue. I love the fact you've mentioned a printed catalogue because my career started off in the world of mail order, um, where, to be fair, our mail order catalogues were probably nowhere near as um, as high spec as the ones I'm guessing you send out. If we could get that paper paper lighter, we got that paper lighter. But um, I guess the, the difference is is between the you know kind of the traditional mail order approach and, and your approach is there's only one of each item you're you're putting in that catalogue, so it's almost more of a an experiential piece than a buy this painting now piece. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we do find that, um, let's say 70 to 80% of the works in the catalogue sell. Mm -hmm. um, but as you say, it's, it's a great way of getting people excited about Saatchi art, coming to the site, going on their own journey of discovery, or, you know, clicking on the art advisory button and coming through to a curator who then helps them to do a whole house or find one piece, whatever it might be that they're looking for. Um, so yeah, it, it, the, the growth of um, sales beyond those, let's say, 100 works that are actually in the catalogue, that's that's what's really exciting about it. Um, and I think that you know it also helps. You mentioned word of mouth, and I think that's also a big part of our business. Obviously, that's much, much harder for us to um, track and uh, quantify, but I think that that is definitely a part of it. And in the kind of the, the offline world, you've also kind of created your own art gallery in some ways, haven't you, with the, with the art fair? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the really interesting things that probably a lot of e-commerce brands um, have been wrestling with and very conscious of is the need to combine um, the online experience with the real world experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so a few years ago, uh, we were thinking of ways of doing this and, and we'd always done... Uh, just with Saatchi Art and the online business, we'd, we'd always done a lot of pop-up shows in different cities um, and they'd always been really successful and it was a great kind of added bonus for um, uh, customers that we already have, but also for new buyers. Um, and so we wanted to try and build on that. And I'd had a relationship with Ryan Stanier, who's the founder of the other art fair um, from you know living in London. So we decided that that would be a great, um, opportunity uh, for us and for our artists and, and buyers. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's really fantastic. It's grown. Um, it actually grew by 100% in Q3 of last year. Wow. Um, and over the past few years, it's gone from five fairs a year to, I think, in 2020, it will be 12 or 13 fairs a year. Um, obviously, London is a is a big um big sort of centre for it and the main office is there. We do two fairs in London, three fairs in London a year. We also have a couple of fairs in Australia and in America. It's now in five cities and we're launching in Toronto um, this year. So I think that's, um, we were talking about opportunities for artists. I mean, an artist likes nothing more than to have their work seen in person. And, um, and the other side of, of that coin is that, you know, people who are considering buying something, they really get this amazing kind of visceral response to seeing a work in, in person. And I think also the other thing that was so important for me about this 
partnership with the fair is that um, there are lots of challenges, certainly, to buying art online. Um, you know, building trust, building confidence, people feeling that if they see something online, it's actually going to be like that when they mm. receive it. I think uh, being able to go to an art fair to see the caliber of the work there, um, which is really outstanding, um, and that then makes you feel, oh, okay, so if I haven't bought something at the fair or it's all a bit rushed for me to make a decision over a weekend, I, there's still such art there, and I can see all of these artists you know, showing at the fair, they're on such yacht too, but I can see more and meet different artists online um, and discover their work. And I think people find that very, very reassuring. And, you know, building trust and confidence in the e-commerce world is so huge. And once you begin to get that right, um, all sorts of things um, begin to sort of fall into place. So, yeah, having sort of real live events has been really important to us over the last few years. I can't ask you anything else on that because you answered it so well. No. <laughs> it's, it, but it is, isn't it? It's, it's so powerful. And we are seeing so many e-commerce brands now creating experiential stores or pop-ups or something in order to create that connection with the customer because it just, it, you know, you can do it to some extent online, but then there's customers who want that offline experience, which then they may come once and never come again, but then you've hooked them, then you've got them and they're, and they're trusting you. Um, Rebecca, there's another element of, of what Sartre Art's been up to that I wanted to kind of get into with you, because as the, the largest online art gallery, you have quite a bit of, bit of um, kind of sway in the market, I would, I would expect. So have you have you been using that at all to kind of change the way the art market moves more so than just getting new buyers into it? Um, yeah, actually, we really have been trying. Um, and uh, I would say it hasn't been that easy um, from a sort of uh, PR perspective, but I do feel we are now gaining traction. And there are some really interesting things around that. One, um, I would say, is uh, the online gallery world in a way has been seen by the rest of the world as a sort of parallel, slightly inferior universe. And I think that that is definitely changing. Um, and I think you cannot ignore the fact that we represent close to 100,000 artists. Um, I mean, that's that's huge. Um, and, to, and to still sort of feel that 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 we're still some different part of the art world. I think that's really kind of changing. It's also changing because a lot of brick and mortar galleries use our website in order to find the galleries that they want to do shows with. <laughs> so, so I think that the way one views the, the art world is, is really being changed by online galleries. Um, and then sort of going in a little bit deeper into that, one of the things that... Um, keeps on coming up in the press about the art world is how poorly represented women are and also artists um, of you know from all over the world in non um, in some of the sort of territories that that don't get so much attention one of the interesting things about Saatchi art um, is that our um, the number of artists that we represent is very equally spread between men and women and in fact, for last year, um, if we look at the success, um, the most successful artists, 54% um, were actually women. And our top selling artist was a woman. So I think that this is something that um, the rest of the art world really needs to take notice of. And what I like about it is that um, you know, sometimes you read these interviews with um, men who are running galleries or men who are running auction houses. And even though there are a lot of women in the art world, um, you tend to find that the people who are the CEOs are men. Mm -hmm. And they always say, oh, but, you know, male artists sell better than um, female artists, which just is not true. Um, and uh, someone said to me the other day, you know, how difficult it, is it for you to try and correct this gender imbalance that sort of we see in the rest of the art world? Um, and just to give you an idea, uh, about 14 percent of acquisitions by museums uh, were by women artists over the last 10 years, 14%, one wow. four. Um, so it's staggering the, the imbalance in the art world. But that isn't the case with our gallery. It's 50-50. And as I say, 54% of the best-selling artists last year were women. And we don't have to struggle to get um, buyers to buy works by women. When you 
have a sort of level playing field with an equal number of male artists and female artists, people are just as happy to buy works by women. It does, you know, so I don't see why the rest of the art world finds it such a challenge. So I really feel that we are a kind of pioneer in in this respect. Um, and also with diversity as well. And it's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about um, because you know, we as a gallery, we should be representing the world of artists and, you know, they're, they're from all over the place and from, you know, it just, it, it has to be a priority. Uh, I know that lots of museums and galleries are making an effort, um, but it's very slow. Um, so I hope that by seeing what we're doing, and the, the way that our data is so dr- different from, you know, the traditional brick and mortar art world that, that they will generally make more changes and, and give it a much, much bigger emphasis. It's because I would imagine the, the average consumer, if you put a couple of paintings up and told them to guess which one was by the woman and which one was by the man, they probably couldn't do it. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it's, it's not in the eye of the beholder, is it? It's a totally false choice. But if Mm. you go into a brick and mortar gallery and uh, 90% of the artists that they represent are men, it's a self-fulfilling thing that 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 gallery would say, oh, well, male artists sell better than women. Um, But we, uh, as a sort of democratic platform where, you know, we don't pick the artists that we represent, they come to us. Obviously, we do a lot of outreach as well, and we're always trying to encourage artists that we want to work with to to join our online gallery but um because of the nature of the the way the kind of uh the the inventory the artists that we represent have come about it's very very different and it's just so fascinating when we look back over the last 10 years and we see this great 50 50 gender split um and it translates not only into you know the, the, the range of the artists that we represent but into sales um, so, you know, that's what, that's one of the things I think that we feel most excited about over the last uh, 10 years since we've been in existence. It's been very steady in that way. Um, and it's just, as I keep on saying, um, it just, uh, I don't understand why the rest of the art world finds it so difficult to catch up. E-commerce master plan is supported by some of the greatest companies in the e-commerce sector. Here's a reminder of who they are. How are the leading D2C brands growing their business? They're using Klaviyo, the growth marketing platform chosen by over 28,000 global innovative online brands. Klaviyo believes in supporting growth, which is why they won't tie you into lengthy contracts, hidden setup or support fees, or feature-based pricing. With a platform that is both powerful and easy to use, it's no surprise so many brands have switched to Klaviyo. Looking for one more compelling reason? Brands switching to Klaviyo see an average of 62 times ROI on their investment. Ready to learn more? Visit klaviyo.com forward slash master plan. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash master plan. Are you interested in selling products on more platforms like Amazon, Google Shopping and eBay? Then you should check out Ecom Dash, multi-channel inventory and order management software. They help online sellers like you sell products in more places with less hassle. With more than 20 integrations, Ecom Dash will automatically update inventory levels, shipping info and more everywhere you sell. Retailers call them their 24-7 salesperson. See what the fuss is all about. Try it free at ecom-dot-com forward slash masterplan and use promo code masterplan to get fifty percent off your first two months. That's e c o m d a s h dot com forward slash masterplan. It's time for the top tips round. Okay, I love this section because it gives me and our listeners some really quick ideas for taking our business to the next level. So, Rebecca, we might not be able to influence many gallery owners um, and the rest of the art world via this podcast necessarily, but we can now influence a few more e-commerce businesses to to improve the way they do business. So, are you ready to give them your top tips? Okay. <laughs> okay, so the book top tip. If everyone listening to this podcast agreed to take Friday off and read a book to make their business better, which book would you recommend? Um... I might not go down the, the book recommendation route. Um, That's okay. That is allowed. You can recommend something alternative. I have a bit of an allergic reaction to those kinds of books that tell you how to run your business. And um, maybe there are good examples, but it's not really the, uh, it's not what I'm drawn to. But I think one of the things that I've really learned um, 
from shifting from you know working at a brick and gallery, uh, brick and mortar gallery myself into uh, the e-commerce world is just how um, how you have to kind of change your mindset. Um, you have to learn to be very agile, very flexible in your thinking. And um, it's one of the things that we all, um, all 36 of us subscribe to on a daily basis. We're constantly testing everything that we do and learning from it. Um, and if you start uh, the year of 2020 with a fixed idea of how the rest of the six months, 12 months hence are going to pan out, um, and you think that you're going to just stick to it, that's probably not the best approach. Um, of course, we have goals for each quarter, but we're constantly um, amending, refining, as I say, testing and learning. And that's something that uh, did not come naturally to me in the world that I used to work in. Um, and uh, it's that's been a really wonderful uh, learning experience for me. And it's that's that's how we've really grown the business, constantly testing and learning from it and making changes. Oh, that's like almost the perfect answer. As the as the listeners know, I end every every single podcast with by telling them to keep optimizing. So, okay. um, so Rebecca, you and I have one mindset with that answer. <laughs> okay, the uh, the traffic top tip: which marketing method do you either prize above all others or think doesn't get the press it deserves? Um, I would say the thing that's really important to us, and we've talked a lot about. Um, Art advisory, the experience for new buyers, um, is that uh, we have come to learn that we cannot just sort of um, tell people, you know, this is what we do, and um, you know, you should therefore be won over immediately. What we need to do is really con continue through content marketing um, to give additional knowledge to show that we have great curators with a lot of expertise. Um, Again, the art advisory experience is part of that um, and constantly providing additional value for all of our customers so that they have this kind of rounded experience. Um, we have a blog where we're always giving um, helpful information about different styles of works, um, uh, how to hang your works even in your home, you know, lots of new artists to discover. Um, if you're interested in artists from a particular country, let's say, and then, of course, being able to sort of remind people that fairs are coming up in different cities that might be close to them. But, yeah, so I really say content marketing is the big thing for us, um, especially when, you know, the Saatchi name is, is well known now I, I, in the UK and in the US. But our, our uh, business is, is global. So we still have a lot of work to do um, in order to educate people about the brand. Excellent. Okay. The tool top tip, maybe a collaboration tool, a social media plugin, a phone app, or just a way of working. Is there a cool little tool you use that makes you and your team more efficient from day to day? Um, I would say maybe Slack has been a really great thing for us. Um, I guess that's used now all over the world really, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, but yeah, it's a very sort of efficient way of communicating with lots of people instantly. Um, yeah, probably that. Excellent. Okay. In, in my head, it's going, wow, an art gallery using Slack. <laughs> There's a proper yeah. juxtaposition yeah. going on in my brain there. Which... I would never have said that t 10 years ago. That would have been anathema to the way I think about things. But yeah, everything is changing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The growth top tip. If you met someone today who's focused on growing their e-commerce business from 100 orders per month to 1,000, what would be your number one tip for them? Um. Well, I think that it's uh, really learning who your customers are. Um, and that's been a challenge for us. And I think that in the last couple of years, um, and actually really last year, which is why we've had such fantastic growth in Q3, as you mentioned, is that we put in a lot of work into understanding who our customers are and also recognizing that you can't please everybody um, and that, you know, you can... Um, we now pretty much know who our core customers are. Um, and there are um, some sort of overlaps as well with smaller groups. And what we've started to do is build campaigns that speak in the right way to all of those different kinds of customers. Um, and I think that's really, really been invaluable. Um, and we've got a fantastic new director of marketing um, and who's been very instrumental in this new approach uh, for us. And it's, yeah, it's, it's had a huge um, transformative effect on our sales. 
Excellent. Well, Rebecca, you've been brilliant. But before you say goodbye, can you let the listeners know, those who are now going, wow, I I really want to go and find out what's going on at Saatchi Art, where they can find you and the business on the web and social media, please. Um, so we're at saatchiart.com. And then you can also find us on Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook. Um, and of course, come to the art fair as well. Um, the next art fair will be in London in March, um, also in New York um, and in May uh, in Sydney. So we hope to see you in person at lots of events as well as online. Awesome. Well, look, Rebecca, as I said, it's been absolutely fascinating um, chatting to you about how to do how to sell a product online, which I think most of us would assume is really, really hard. And it's um, it's been really enlightening, and I'm sure everyone will have learnt, learnt a lot from our discussion. So, um, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. It's been really great. I've enjoyed it enormously. So interesting there to, to dive into the world of selling a product, which I think, as I said, many of us would assume was very, very hard to sell online. To be able to speak to someone who's running, you know, involved in the running of one of the largest online art galleries in the in the world is, is also really, really interesting to see how when you have that scale, you can take it to another level. And I think the key thing within that is, I suppose, the importance that they put on dealing with their suppliers, which is your artists and having good relationships with them and being able to then take that knowledge they have of the product to then create that kind of curated or that uh, that advisory service to the consumer. They've taken it into the offline world to continue building that relationship with people. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting business and it's one I'm certainly going to be paying attention to to see what they do in the coming months and years. If you want to get the notes from today's show, including the top tips, links, these have a couple of related episodes, which I've been jotting down as we have been chatting, which I think you're going to find really interesting too, if this one tickled your fancy, then do head over to ecommercemasterplan.com forward slash podcast. And if you're enjoying the show, please do share it with your e-commerce friends. Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, over a coffee, over a pint, I don't mind. But it's always lovely when you guys spread the word and we get more e-commerce people listening, learning and getting things from this show that are going to help them take their business to the next level. I hope you have a great week and make sure you keep optimizing. Thank you for listening to the e-commerce master plan podcast. Find out more at ecommercemasterplan.com slash podcast.